Hudgens with us today. He's doing a great job uh, uh, on the ballot this fall, and we'll let uh, Commissioner Hudgens uh, go from there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for helping us re-elect the complete Republican ticket. I tell you, for the first time ever, we've got a, a Republican in every office, and we need to keep it that way. In the insurance world, my battle right now, really not my battle, but what I get accused of having a battle is Obamacare. But let me tell you, Obamacare is a total, total disaster. It, uh, if, if you want to get a quick glimpse of what Obamacare is going to result in, if we don't repeal it, look at what's happening in the Veterans Administration. That's exactly what's going to happen with us if we don't repeal this. Now, I'm not saying let's just repeal it and do away with it. We need to repeal it and replace it. And there are some, uh, Congressman Price, Tom Price from Georgia, has a wonderful plan, but we need to take an incremental approach to th this problem we have with health care. We don't need an omnibus bill that does everything in the world like this one tried to do. You know, the president has, has delayed in this bill 71 different times. He has said, well, we're, this is what the, what the bill says, and then he, he changes his mind and he delays it. Governor, that doesn't happen in our state. I was in the legislature for 14 years. Every time we passed a bill, then we, we sent it to the governor. If the governor signed it, then it became law, and we expected every, the agency that it applied to to uniformly enforce that bill and, and do what it says. But President Obama says that, well, I can just, uh, I don't like this part, so we're going to delay it, and I think it's time we call his hands. I hope that uh, I see our uh, nominee for, uh, for Senator David Perdue back here. We've got to elect David to help us get the majority in the U.S. Senate. If we can get the majority in the Senate and maintain the majority in the House, which we will, uh, Congressman Collins is here. I'm right here. Where, wherever he is. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Uh, he's doing a great job. But we can we can maintain that majority, get the majority in the Senate. Then we can call his bluff. Right now, Harry Reid is being an absolute obstructionist on everything that is a good piece of legislation. And we need to we need to do our part. The only part we can do is to make sure that David Perdue is, is elected and uh, Michelle Nunn is not. And I'm not going to get into that race, but I was at the <laughs> Yeah, I guess I am. I was, uh, I was at the Chamber of Commerce event where David and Michelle had a, a debate, and I have never seen anybody misrepresent their stands as much as Michelle Nunn did. She absolutely, all she wanted to do is talk about, we need to have a team, we need to have consensus building, we need this and that, and I thought I was going to have to resuscitate my wife. I thought she was going to pass out, and I thought I was going to absolutely puke listening to her. I mean, I don't know why you're videotaping, but yes, I think that. So, anyway, I'm running for re-election. I have two opponents. I have a, a lady that uh, she ran for insurance commissioner in Florida. Uh, she lost that. Then she moved to Georgia. She ran for state rep against John Burns. She lost that. Then she ran for chairman of the county commission in Bullock County. She lost that. Then she ran for clerk of court in Bullock County, and she lost that. And I was telling uh, a campaign consultant about her record and his response is boy she's due and I said no Michael that's not what I'm looking for I want to keep her string alive but the, but the, but the funny one was I was on the 14th floor of the West Tower and a guy was up there and he said aren't you Ralph Hutchins and I said I am he said well I'm 
and I can't remember his name now for, for the life of me. But he introduced himself. He said, I'm running against you for insurance commissioner. I said, you are? I said, what brought that on? He said, well, I used to be a Republican. I got real disenfranchised with what they were doing. And so I started going to the Libertarian Party meetings. I was at the Libertarian Party meeting in Cobb <coughs> County. They were going over their candidate list. And they said, we need somebody to run for insurance commissioner. He said, well, I've got 22 years experience as an agent. They said, good, you're our candidate. <laughs> That's the way he's in there. But we I need to get over 50% of the vote with your help. That'll happen. And with your help, we'll be able to keep our Republican ticket. And I want to introduce a friend of mine, Richard Woods. Richard is who I supported in the primary I, uh, because he was opposed to Common Core. And I'm opposed to Common Core. And so I supported him. But Richard Woods is our uh, the the candidate for school superintendent, and uh, let's let's give him a warm Dawson County welcome. Well, again, one of the good things here that uh, if uh, if I guess Mr. Hudgens does uh, lose his cookies, I work at, a, at, a, uh, at a, an elementary school, so I have uh, you know, that. experience that I can uh, you know, come in behind and, uh, and make sure everything's taken care of. But, but uh, my name is Richard Woods, and again, I can also say uh, I am not in South Georgia. This is a beautiful part of the state, but I do live in Tifton, Georgia, so I'm about four, four and a half uh, miles south of here. But uh, it is a privilege to be the Republican nominee for uh, you know, state superintendent of schools. And as your next, next state school superintendent, again, one of the things I can assure is that I do bring experience to this office. Again, for 22 years, I worked in the Irwin County School System, uh, working 14 years as a classroom and social studies teacher, and eight years in administration, working from assistant principal, principal K-5 curriculum director, and the list goes on and on uh, with that. But again, everything was pre-K through 12th grade at the school level. So, uh, you know, things that I talk about come from firsthand experience. And because of the, I have that first-hand experience, one of the things we look at is that what are we going to do for our, for our children and what are we going to do for our school system to make sure that each child has the opportunity to succeed. Well, first thing, we are going to be child-focused, and that means we are going to make sure that we personalize and not standardize education, you know, because our children is not one-size-fits-all. You know, they are completely different, and we need to have the flexibility to take, the, take our children where they are at and move them forward, and that is my commitment to do that. Because if we fail the children, honestly, we have failed in education. So that will be the primary focus to do that. But in order to, to make sure that we are uh, personalize our education <coughs> system, that means we've got to go to our teachers. And we've got to allow our teachers to once again do the job that they went to school to do. And we do that by reducing and eliminating unnecessary paperwork, data collecting. And instead of teaching to the test, we teach to the child. Again, coming from a, a period of with no child left behind, which I worked very diligently with, you know, all we heard about was the test, the test, the test. Well, at that point, we began to miss the important thing in education, where it should be about the child, the child, the child. And in doing that, by allowing, focusing on our teachers and our kids, that means we concentrate on our classroom. By concentrating on the classroom, we will make sure that our kids, by the time they leave fifth grade, they will be proficient in reading, writing, and math because those are the foundational skills that build on any, everything else that goes on beyond that point. For myself as a high school social studies teacher, content was not an issue. But the issue that I had was that you know, our kids needed to read and read in comprehension. And as your next state school superintendent, my commitment is to make Georgia the number one literate state in our nation. Because if we can teach our kids to read, if they can have that foundation, the, or, the, the, the doors of opportunity will be boundless to them. And so we will do that. But also being a foundationist, that means that we'll do some things that we look at and we make sure that our kids understand and appreciate our great rich history. We will teach history and be more diligent with that. We will teach the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, you know, all the great works that we have. We will not leave that out because I firmly believe that as our children leave uh, the high school and, and, and Georgia education, you know, if they understand it's better to be independent from and not dependent on government, we have done a great thing because that means we will have citizens that will begin to build on our, our capitalistic you know, uh, system we have as far as economics, but also they will remember and cherish you know, what has made America great. And that is something that we have to do that is very, very important. 
Again, I also need your help. And again, please go to my website, woodsforsuper.com, and, you know, and visit there. But join us on Facebook and Twitter uh, because, you know, I still do math the old-fashioned way. And what I understand is that I'm just one individual. But you out here, you know 10 people who know 10 people who know 10 people. And so we have to get that message out that we have the best plan and we have the best organization for us. And now I would like to, uh, to introduce uh, our current and our next uh, Commissioner of Labor or Secretary of Labor, Mark Butler. So again, appreciate that. I don't think they gave me enough link here to work with. I'd like to move around. Y'all excited about this election? Yeah. 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 All right, it needs to be. This is a very important election. We've got a lot to talk about. First of all, I'm going to give everybody kind of an example about the difference between a Democrat run Department of Labor and a Republican run the Department of Labor. When I got there, we had a very, very bloated Department of Labor. And what I thought was way too many employees. So he said, you know what? The people elected me to give you efficient government. And we've done that. We've reduced our workforce, not positions. That's a difference. Some people will trick you with that. I'm talking about people there. We've reduced our positions by 31%. We have 650 less people working at the Department of Labor today than we had three and a half years ago. And the good thing about that is, it seems like that'd be bad, but guess what? We're actually doing a better job today than we were doing three and a half years ago because we're concentrating <laughs> on getting people a job not an unemployment check, because that's what it's really about. Now, there's been a lot of talk here recently about, you know, oh, Georgia is going the wrong direction. Well, let's talk about that really quick. And I'm going to kind of give you the numbers, and the governor's going to tell you a little bit more about it in just a minute. But let's just talk about this latest little bump in the unemployment rate. You know, uh, little, little Mr. Carter, he is very upset right now about the unemployment rate. He's very concerned about the job loss we've seen over the last three months. Guess what? He's not telling you the whole story. Anybody like to guess which private sector has lost jobs over the last three months? Hmm. That's not private sector. You pretty much answered it. It has not been any private sector job loss. The job loss comes from 45,000 jobs lost. What is your name? What is your name? Sir, what is your name? What is your name, sir? Identify yourself. What is your name? What is your name? Let go of me. What is your name? Sorry about this. The lady was asked to leave us. Twelve years of politics, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Last three months, the job loss, the reason why we've had it, has been 45,000 less government jobs in the last three months. The private sector has put up 42 thousand jobs in the last three months. Which one do you think is more important? Private sector or government? Yeah. Private sector. That's right. And here's another important fact that the Democrats won't tell you. And they say, oh, we're 49th out of all the states in the unemployment rate. There's a more important stat. Look, I tell people all the time and tell them for three years, don't pay attention to the unemployment rate because a lot of times that can be misleading. You gotta look at the numbers that got you there. The last 12 months, right now, <coughs> We are sixth in the nation in net job growth. That's the important number. That's what the work this man has been doing to give this state the right kind of atmosphere to grow jobs. And the, since he's been in office, since January 2011, he has been able to help us and help Georgia's businesses create almost 300,000 jobs. Folks, that's real. Now, if they think that's going the wrong direction, I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, he's already gone out and said that he's got all these policies he wants to put out there to create jobs, but he's already admitted they're not going to have any effect right away. Well, I don't know about this, but we've had a pretty good job growth that it went right into effect right away. <laughs> Never a dull moment. You know, I have had a lot of things happen during speeches. <laughs> I even had a beauty contest come over the speakers one time, but this is a new one. This is what it comes down to. We've got to make sure that we get Governor Deal back in office. We've got to make sure David Perdue uh, gets reelected. But I need to ask you one more favor. The Democrats, how they will get back into power in the state of Georgia is by knocking off down ballot races. 
Now, if you don't think these dam out races are important, it is extremely important. We need to make sure you tell your friends when they vote, don't quit voting at the top of the ticket. Go all the way down. If you don't think that doesn't happen, go back and you take a look at the runoff right here. When Purdue and Richard Woods, total voters drop off between Purdue's race and Superintendent's race was over 100,000 voters dropped out. That's how we lose down ballot races right there. It's not because we don't have better candidates. It's because people lose interest. Make sure they stay in there. Okay? One public service announcement. I was asked by Brian Kemp to give his apologies for not being here, but he is doing some good work today. He's down in southeast Georgia helping Rick Allen, hopefully knock off John Barrow, and give us one more Republican in our delegation going to Congress. And I think that's a pretty good reason for him to be here. that I like to bring up my friend, my very good friend, who knows more than I'll ever even pretend to know about agriculture. Somebody who I kind of think of as kind of a brother in arms. He also took over an agency that had always been run by a Democrat and he's had to have his own challenges. I had to update software. He had to get rid of the typewriters. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a lot better position, though I did send you those typewriter ribbons right when you got in office. I, I did do that. So please give a warm welcome to my friend, Gary Black. Thank you, Mark. Well, uh, by the way, maybe we can have a Republican uh, fundraiser here before too long. We'll have a silent auction. I still have three microfish readers that, uh, we can get in your hands as a memento. Uh, you know, it's, it's awfully good to be with you. Down ballot thing, let me, let me hit that first. I'm in DeKalb County four years ago. This happened. The governor and this deal have heard this before. I'm there. I came up to a lady just like that, ma'am. I said, ma'am, I'm Gary Black. I'm running for Western Agriculture. I'd love to earn your vote. And she said, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, ma'am, well, we do food safety and weights and measures and fuel pumps and but then everything else in agriculture. And she said, that's wonderful. I wish I could vote for you, but I cannot. We were in DeKalb County, and I said, well, why not, ma'am? That's when she said, I live in Rockdale County. She, I said, ma'am, this is a constitutional office to which she said, I'm 61 years old. I've never seen it on the ballot. And so that message about down ballot is real. Now there are lots of good reasons about down ballot folks like me too, and when your when your neighbors that are out there that do understand what we do, and if agriculture and food safety and animal issues are important to you, then if they're not important to other people that you may know that may live in Marietta or in downtown Atlanta or in downtown Columbus or somewhere, when a neighbor like you picks up and calls, say you may not have a preference, but I do. I can, I've got hundreds of stories of how that has impacted our campaign in the past. So I'm going to ask you to do that again. Get that top ten in your, in your telephone. Get those texts going when it comes up to early voting and getting down to the day. And that's how you drive this down ballot vote. Now ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each of you for your for the opportunity first to serve. Many of you, boy, you've, uh, people like Johnny Burton and took my water a long time. I'm at home right here. 34 years ago, I started student teaching in Dawson County High School <laughs> underneath Lloyd Harbin. Well, actually, Lloyd's a pretty big guy. I wasn't underneath him. I was too excited. But, uh, uh, and and uh, came up in those ranks. Uh, didn't get, never, never did enter the classroom professionally, but still have all those values and just uh, stayed right up the road here. So. This is one of the original agritourism venues ever in the state. It's because of Johnny Burt and a couple others in the state's reason that part of our industry is growing because they set an example almost a generation ago and a lot of people have caught on. Uh, at the department, I hope from a stewardship report we can give you a good one, and that is uh, fiscal responsibility and some organizational skills that we've got employed that uh, I think you'll be pleased. Uh, our website is votegaryblack.com, and rather than just uh, go through that list with you today, I hope you'll, you'll take a look there. Sign up for our newsletter, and you can really go in step by step how we've taken a real strategic approach. We had a 
hey, wait a minute, that's an, that is a Republican value, isn't it? Why don't we get a plan, and why don't we work the plan, and why don't we bring fiscal responsibility and personal responsibility into the lives of people, challenge them and set high expectations, and guess what? When that happens, I'm confident people want to meet that. And that's what we've seen at your department. A servant's heart, a servant, a, 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 an attitude of yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir and no sir. And I'm so thankful that I have email banks after email banks full of people saying, I called your department and I cannot believe it's the government. And I don't know, every one of them are not that way. Uh, that's, why we're, that's why we're a work in motion. But I, I'm, that, that couldn't be a higher compliment play, paid than when we were able to do that. I have a challenge for you. Uh, I would suggest to you that uh, when we, we're about to enter this, this field where we're, everybody's going to be casting votes, there are some who traditionally vote with us. There are some who traditionally vote on the other side. But what I'd like to cast a vision for you is let's communicate over these next 70 some odd days what's good for Georgia. And ladies and gentlemen, our vision is a better vision for the future of Georgia. I'm satisfied that most Georgians want to secure a border and they want a senator that's going to fight and go do that. And that doesn't make a difference. What's your tradition? However you vote, I think most real Georgians want a secure border. Most real Georgians they want a governor that's going to make us the best state in the nation to do business because they want a job because they realize that's the best way. Not the hand out, but the hand up. That's the better vision for the future of Georgia. I think most people want safe food and strong farms and a responsible government, which we've, we've been talking a lot about for the last five years. And that responsibility comes with having, uh, you know, putting a million dollars more in the bank than we did last year and doing it quicker. That's what we did on our business side. It comes from taking state farmers markets making $1.8 million to making $3.6 million and gross revenue must have been only went up 600000 So you can do the math on that real quick. It, it's, it's applying those principles. That's what most Georgians want. Regardless of how they traditionally vote, I suggest to you most Georgians want that. And so what we've got to do, ladies and gentlemen, is meet, the, meet, our, meet our friends in the trenches. And we've got to ask that critical question. Don't you think that's important? As a Georgian, as for the future of Georgia, isn't this the better vision moving forward for the next generation? And I'd suggest to you folks, if we'll communicate that way, it'll be an overwhelming victory in November. Amen. And that's where we need to go. Are y'all ready to win an election? That's what I want to know. Step, step by step, mailbox by mailbox, door by door, Sunday school class member by Sunday school class member. That's how we win this election. Yeah, our future, the next generation, is at stake. And I look forward to the opportunity uh, to help serve again. I ask each of you for your vote. I do not assume that you're here. It would be easy to assume that everybody here has not don't have their, doesn't have their mind made up. But I don't want to. I, I I don't take that lightly. The vote is a precious, a precious blessing. And so I ask you to invest it in our vision. Let's let's put this vision together for the future of Georgia, all up and down this ticket. It's such a great honor to to be with this team. Our team's the best. We're the best. We're, and we've got the best ideas. Let's push forward. I will ask you this. Uh, we are. This is a T-shirt brigade campaign, and I've got some more out there. The theme of this campaign is keep Georgia growing. And I hope that there not be a single green t-shirt left out there. And if you need more up here in Dawson County and North, uh, North Georgia, we're going to make sure it's there. I have the best lawyer <laughs> that anybody could ever hope to have. I'm thankful that I don't have to call him often. Uh, but when I do, he's there to serve. He's your attorney general. He's my lawyer. Y'all help welcome Sam Lowe. First, let me tell you, I'm thrilled to have Gary as a client, and what he's done is uh, remarkable, similar to Mark's story about what he's done. Let me be uh, possibly politically incorrect here a second. If we stand for anything as a party, what are we afraid of with a lady having a camera filming us? What are we saying here that shouldn't be on film? 
what message are we sending that because it's private property they shouldn't be filming it? What is the harm? The harm that occurs post this is far greater than the harm of her filming us. What are we hiding? If we're telling you why we're running and what we stand for, what are we hiding? There's no reason for that. That is not right. It is private property. The private property owner has the right to not have the person there. Who's the winner in the long run? Not a good move. So now that I shocked all of you by saying what I think is right, let me continue to tell you what I think is right. This morning when we were starting our day, and I apologize right after this, we're going to Barrow County and it starts in an hour. I'm told that's a two hour drive. So right after this, we're splitting over there. Piece of cake. Yeah, piece of cake. You can do these mountain roads yeah. in 30. Um, there was a new article in the hill.com. The Hill is a publication that Doug knows and many other congressmen, senators know. I'm sure the governor's very familiar with the Hill over the years. And they were talking about that fourth branch of government called executive agencies, regulatory government. So the president's busy at Martha's Vineyard. He's busy telling us on the one hand that he is totally uh, disgusted with ISIS and then five minutes later he's on the golf course. And then you hear all the chatter on the TV stations, whether it's good or bad that he's disengaged because if he was engaged, what would he then do? Well, let me suggest to you, if you don't think our president's engaged, you haven't watched the last five and a half years. As our country's going further and further the wrong direction, there's a reason that I'm in all these federal courts. There's a reason that we keep fighting everything regarding the Affordable Care Act, that we keep fighting everything regarding Dodd-Frank, which is to the financial industry what the Affordable Care Act is to the healthcare industry. There's a reason that, that Georgia was a party in two cases before the U.S. Supreme Court this year on energy. There's a reason we're all against 111D because we actually want to be able to afford energy. There's a reason we're all against the new proposed rule on waters because we don't think a ditch is a water that that farmer has to worry about as to whether he could grow crops. That's one of the Amen. issues yeah. Gary and I are working yeah. together now. So for, for people to sit there and say he's engaged, he's not disengaged. He's just operating that fourth branch of government. And I would suggest to you he's doing a darn good job of it. If you go on regulations.gov, which is a site, it will tell you all the regulations where comment is now welcome and all the regulations where the comment is over and where they're determining the final policy. There are thousands of these regulations that totally skirt Congress. So when Ralph was talking about all the stuff going on there, it's not slowing down and it's not going to slow down the next two and a half years. And we need to be mindful of it. So yeah, we need David in the Senate. And yeah, we need to have more congressmen and more senators throughout the country. But you know, th this man hasn't exactly shown to you over the last five and a half years that he's really concerned about checks and balances. So that's why you have to constantly be in litigation. Now, one of these issues we spend a lot of time on as attorneys general is what's called sue and settle. That's where a group such as an environmental uh, agency sues the EPA, but before they sue, they already have the settlement agreements in tow that have them doing more than what federal law requires. And we're never part of the process. The business community in the state or in the industry, we're never part of the process. They talk to EPA, they do all the documents, they get the agreement, they file the lawsuit, they file the consent order, and hey, it's ours. We're stuck with it. No recourse, no avenue to respond. One congressman in this country has made that one of his main issues, and that's Representative Doug Collins. And in fact, Doug, in his first term, got a bill passed in the House to actually deal with that. Now the problem, David Perdue, is we haven't gotten it passed in the Senate. So we need, we need help in the Senate there. So when you're there, we hope that you'll help Doug with that bill. Because when we talk about regulatory overreach, there's nothing more regulatory overreach than having an agency work in a conniving manner, deceptive manner, to settle a lawsuit that they created and shared with the agency before it was filed, and then everyone stuck with it. So it's my great honor to introduce a gentleman who, of course, was a, a household name in the legislature, did a fantastic job, but he is doing a great, great job up in Congress helping us and bringing back the power to the people rather than to the president. So please give a great welcome 
to Congressman Thomas. Thank you all so much. But I tell you what, for those who know me, I'm a shy wallflower kind of guy. Yep, you are. I have a Methodist voice. No, wait, wait, I'm a Baptist preacher. I think I, my voice is going to carry. Any problem in the back, back here? Not a problem. I tell you what, guys, it's a great time to be in Georgia. It's a great time to be a Republican. It's a great time to take a message of growth. It's a great time to take a message of hope. It's a great time that I wish I had an attorney general that, uh, in Washington that liked me as opposed to one that doesn't like me. But given this attorney general, I'll take that, okay? He just doesn't. But that's okay because I have a different vision of life. And this is the thing that I guess, because I can look around this, this, this barn and I see one, I just love being back in a barn. I just think, you, you, you. scary part, a little sawdust, an open air barn. I'm here in, it's, it's August in Georgia. I hear camp meetings ready to go. <laughs> but what we're selling today is the fact that conservatism works. Conservatism matters. And when you look up and down what the guys in, have all been talking about in the races down ballot and, and why we need to show up, it's because that there are folks that are not in this barn today. They're going down this road who don't attend a party meeting. They don't attend. They may look at an ad on TV and they cut it off because they're tired of hearing the same stuff. But they're going to go in that poll and they're going to vote because they know it's what they're supposed to do. So the question is, how do you get to those down ballots? How do you get conservative messages to them? It's by a cup of coffee at work. It's by going at the t-ball game or at the football game on Friday nights and saying, hey, I want to tell you about something. You know why a balanced budget works? It's because then we can prioritize our spending and we can put our country back on a, on a safe level. You know why, why getting regulations out of the way in a piece of that legislation like sue and settle matters? And by the way, David, I'll pass it along to you. You can be the first. You can introduce it. We'll co-sponsor it again next session. How about that? <laughs> we'll get that in the Senate. Why it matters is because jobs are at stake. Because instead of worrying about a ditch moving in the middle of the road that has no water in it unless it rains and calling that a navigable waterway and killing jobs, why don't we work together to say what builds industry and what builds jobs? That's what I see as a, as a vision. That's what I want to see, is we work for a government that works for what the people matters. And what, you know, frankly, and, and I'm a governor. We, I've watched the governor for 30 something years. He's been a dear friend before he ever was in office. And watched him over the years. And getting to know David Perdue and his heart for what he's running for. And all these other guys with, that are down ticket and others and, and above ticket for me, however you want to put it. But the, the desire is this, what are we doing this for? We're doing this because of the simple fact that conservatism matters. Limited government, smaller government, not just slogans that you throw out there, but there's stuff that we need to act upon. Because when you act upon it, then everybody rises up. Everybody, whether they agree or disagree, they rise up. And you know what I found? I don't know about you, but when money's in the house and the family's happy, things just seem to go better. And when the economy is rising, when jobs are there, when America is strong overseas and we don't have an apologetic president to the world, then life is back in order. So that's what it's all about here today. That's why it means when we get out here, and not just in these environments. This is the this is the pet rally. Now I challenge you to go out and find five or ten or fifteen or twenty others to say this is why we need Nathan Dill as governor. This is why we need David Perdue as senator. This is why we need to put Doug Collins back in there because I am running again as well. And I need you, buddy. Why Gary Black and Rich Wood and Mark Butler and, and everybody is going on as Sam Owens. This is why it matters because when we look at it, people are looking at us to lead. And I believe the conservatives lead the best. And when we take that message out there, I can do so with a smile on my face. Town halls are wonderful things. If you don't have to sit there for an hour and a half and answer all the questions. <laughs> and I've been doing that though, because I love it. But I want to share this one story before I introduce. I had a gentleman come up to me the other night. He looked at me and he, he, bowed, he just sort of dropped his head. It's over in Jefferson. And he looked at me and he said, he said, Congressman, he said, I hadn't asked a question. He said, I didn't want to raise my hand. He said, but I got a question for you. He said, I listen to the, he said, I read on the internet and I listen. And he said, I just don't want to thank it. He said, and then he stopped and he paused and he dropped his head. And I'll never forget this. He looks up at me and he says, are we about over as a nation? I've been in a Iraq. I've talked to folks who've lost a lot of things. I've, I've done a lot of things in life that are hard. But that stopped me in my tracks. And I looked at him and I regained my composure for a second. I smiled at him and I said, you know what? If I thought it was, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Because I do believe when you educate, when you talk, and when you love, and when you get a message that's right, that's what makes America great. 
and we've got to share that vision. I need some help. The other delegation in Georgia needs some help. And I heard somebody say the other night, we need David Perdue to fight Harry Reid. No, I need David Perdue and the majority to get rid of Harry Reid so that he can go up there and bring it up. So it's my great pleasure to from South Georgia who's coming to Dawsonville up here in our world, David Perdue. Thanks so much. This is unfair. This is twice in two days I've had to follow him. Yeah. Baptist preacher, give me a break. <laughs> Y'all, you know, I am so humbled that I'm, that I'm standing here as your nominee. I mean, you look at these people that are that are running for office, that are in office, uh, I'm humbled to be among that group because they are making a difference. And that's what I hope to do. That's why I got in this race. You know, let me tell you how I, I got here. And, and I think you should have that question because I've never done this before. But I was going into a meeting, not dissimilar to this, it was a little later at a restaurant, maybe 90 people in a, in, a, in a meeting. And I'm opening the door, I'm a little bit late, and this lady's coming in, and she looks like she's in her 80s. And about this tall, and, and she looks at me, and she says, you're that baby's guy, aren't you? I thought, oh, yes ma'am, I'm the baby's guy. She said, I just have one question for you. And I said, oh boy. Now look, my mom is 88, and there's not much, there's no filter between her brain and her mouth. And so you never know what's gonna come out. And this, this lady was so sweet and so nice, and she looked at me and she says, I just have one question. Have you ever been in an elected office before? I said, no, ma'am. And I didn't know what to expect. She said, well, you got my vote. <laughs> you know, and that tells a story. People in Georgia, and I've been around for the last year and a half, talking to people just like this, one-on-one, -on -one, all over the state, just what Doug and others are doing right now. And listen, those town hall meetings, he takes more away than the people who are there because he's listening. And I've been listening, and what they're worried about, and what they're fretting about, and what they're mad about is what's happening in Washington, D.C. Let me give you a contrast. We've got two types of government working right now. One is in the state, and it works. It's the number one place in the country to do business right now in the state of Georgia because you've got a governor who understands economic development. Think about this. You have to have economic development. You have to have five things. You have to have water. You have to have cheap, dependable power. You have to have infrastructure, you have to have an educated workforce, and you have to have regulations that are supportive of economic development. In this state, all five of those are being met, and guess what? We're working, okay? I agree with whoever said it, Sam or somebody, don't worry about that unemployment mark. Don't worry about the unemployment number. Worry about the number of jobs created, the raw number. That's what's important. I won't steal the governor's thunder, but man, it's great news right now in the state of Georgia. The problem is, how much better could we be doing if you didn't have all these regulations from Washington piling up on our backs? Y'all, I got in here because I thought it was an economic crisis, and it is. It's worse than I thought. The debt's outrageous, it's out of control, but our fight's bigger than that. I really believe that we are in an ideological battle for our country. Dick Cheney actually just said this a few weeks ago. For the first time in his career, in his life, he's worried about our republic. I, sp I spoke with him a year ago. He was here with three other past Secretaries of Defense at a presentation at dinner the night before at a private meeting I asked the question, or somebody asked the question, what's the number one threat to our national security? Donald Rumsfeld immediately said, it's our own federal debt, and the fact that we're still borrowing about a third of what we're spending as a country. And that really, that concerned him about our ability to maintain our military, have a strong foreign policy, and to really drive this economy. The number one issue in Georgia right now is the debt, the economy, and jobs. People are very concerned about that. And that's another reason I got in this. But I'll tell you this, my battle is with a Democrat who's perpetrating the same lie, and we all need to listen to this, because this, in my race, is an education about what's in the Democratic mindset, and that is a strategy of deception. If you look at what they've said in that plan, they can't let us, and they can't let the other voters of Georgia know what they really feel about the issues. And so they have a strategy of deception. We've seen it already in my race in the general election. They are absolutely trying to deceive the voters of Georgia. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get us back to the conservative values of our founders. It's pretty simple. If you read the documents back there, they're not complicated. But look where how far we've come away from economic opportunity, not guarantees, fiscal responsibility, limited government, individual freedom, liberty. All right, we've come a long way when the federal government can tell me that they know more about what life or what health insurance that I should have than my wife and I. And that's what happened. My wife and I actually lost our insurance and it's unconscionable. We're going to win this race because of people just like you. We cannot give Harry Reid one more vote in the United States Senate, right? right. So here's what we got to do. I'm preaching to the choir. Let me echo what everybody else has said. But I'm going to change this a little bit. 
I don't like the word up ballot and down ballot. I know what they're talking about. It's, it's how the names are listed on the ballot. I get it. Well, let me give you another characterization. Because I've asked people to do two things here. Trust me, but then stand with me. Not behind me. Not behind Governor Deal. Not behind Gary Blatt. We're all standing in a line right here. Just like our forefathers did in the Revolutionary War. They took care of the people right in front of them. If you'll get up here in line with us, we'll win this ticket. We'll take back the Senate, and we'll get our country moving in the right direction again. So will you do that? Yeah. 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 After this, we can take our country back. I've got the privilege right now, and I'm nervous because it's the first time I've ever done this. I get to introduce a sitting governor of, of the state of Georgia. And let me tell you why I'm so excited about this. <laughs> He's going to help me get elected. That's how selfish I am. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I've watched this man. He, is, uh, he has come into this office and developed an attitude toward economic development and growing jobs like I've never seen. And he's serious about it. So when he talks to you about it, it's really from his heart. And I think Doug and everybody else on this ticket will echo that. We can, can you imagine Jason Carter running a $40 billion enterprise called the state of Georgia? No. Seriously. We can't let that happen. But you know what? If we don't go out and vote, and we don't do what these other guys are talking about and get the other guys to go out and vote, that could happen. Michelle Nunn could slip into the Senate. Can you imagine giving Harry Reid one more vote in the United States Senate? We can't let that happen on our watch. I want the governor to come tell you what a great job he's doing. We've got to get him elected to four more years and keep this thing going. Governor Deal, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you all for being here today. Thanks to the birds for making this possible for us to come out. And you've heard from some very important people. Um, many of these were constitutional officers that were running back in 2010, four years ago, when I was running for governor. And that was the year that, for the first time, Republicans took every uh, constitutional office in the state of Georgia. We had of course the control of the House and the Senate and those numbers there on the Republican side have grown as well. But you know this is an important year and we're all in the business of talking about our races and why we think we should be elected or re-elected. But David and the others have said it very appropriately. It really does matter what form of government and leadership you have both at the local level, the state level, and at the federal level. Now, when I came into office, our state was still in the midst of the Great Recession. Uh, our revenue was not picking up. It had somewhat stabilized, but we still had to make hard decisions about how we were going to spend the money that was available to us. With the help of the General Assembly, and I have several of the, well, at least I see Steve here. Um, do I have others here? Okay, anyway, Steve, you tell the rest of them I bragged on them. <laughs> they came in and, and they decided they were going to work together with me. And what we did was made hard choices. We did not cut K-12 through education. That was one of the only areas of state funding that we actually increased only slightly for the first few years. But this year, we raised the funding for K through 12 by over a half a billion dollars because the policy we put in place had allowed us to do so because we were growing the revenue of our state. And my opponent, who now says he's running on education as his primary goal is to increase funding of education, he voted for those first three budgets that did not have nearly as much money in it as this one but after he decided he was going to run for governor, he voted against this budget. Now finally the press is getting around to asking him why. Why would you vote in three budgets that the governor presented that didn't have as much money in it for K through 12 and then this year when it had significant money, the most money we put in it in seven years, why'd you vote against it? Well, we need to talk about something else, you know. He has no answers. He says he's going to find a billion dollars of waste in state government. Well, you know what? We have reduced the size, the authorized size 
of our state employees by 10%. That translates to about 9,000 slots that have been reduced. We have tried to whittle out and find any kind of waste that is there. We've consolidated agencies. We made the hard decisions to be able to do that. You may have seen uh, Kyle Wingfield's article in the AJC, and I don't usually recommend you read the AJC. <laughs> he is the only thing they have that's close to a conservative journalist in their staff. He did an analysis of it in his column the other day. And what he came out with is you can't come anywhere close to that without doing some significant damage to this state. Yeah, you can get a billion dollars, but you'd have to close down all of our prisons. I don't think many people want to do that. You can get a billion dollars if you do away with our entire judiciary. You do away with the legislative branch and the executive branch of government. You're still a little bit short, by the way, when you do all of that. This is a candidate who is saying anything. He talks in generalities. He speaks in cliches. And folks, you know, a cliche has never created a job. <laughs> Rhetoric has never created a job. It takes having good ideas and then working very, very hard to implement them to make a change. I decided that if we were going to get our state out of this hole, we were in and we're not making much progress to get out of it. We needed to focus on one thing, and that was job creation. Because I believe a job is the foundation for an individual to support themselves, for a family to support the family. They can be charitable in their community, and more importantly, perhaps than anything else, they have less reason to ask government to do things for them. Have you ever noticed that the difference between Republicans and Democrats on that issue is that when hard times hit, Democrats can think of all the ways in the world to expand government programs. Many of them are entitlement programs that you have a very hard time ever getting under control or abolishing. Republicans say, let's use the resources we have, put it in the right places, and we believe that the free enterprise system will produce the right results. And Mark, as Labor Commissioner, has already talked about it briefly. We are now rapidly approaching 300,000 new private sector jobs since January of 2011, which is when I came to office. Now about a third of those are directly related to some 1,400 projects that the State Department of Economic Development has worked with and worked on. We have a great Department of Economic Development, and they work with local chambers of commerce, local economic development teams, and together they are able to bring these businesses to our state from other places and to help those that are here that want to expand. Jason Carter said the other day, we need professional economic developers working for the state of Georgia because the only thing that the ones we have now know how to do is to go to ribbon cuttings. Well, that is an ultimate insult to the people in the Department of Economic Development who work so very hard. We have 10 outposts around the world of people representing Georgia in other parts of the world, and they are bringing businesses. If you wonder why they come from all of these different places, they come because we have an arm and an outreach, and we're bringing people. We even had one the other day from Latvia. <laughs> it's coming up, a, a plant that's coming to Dublin, Georgia, from Latvia. They make fiberglass products. That is the first time that we can find that a company from a, a country that was behind the old so part of the old Soviet Union has ventured into the United States and they're coming to middle Georgia and creating a plan. I met the guy, he speaks German, a little bit of English. We communicated and I came away with this impression. Here's a guy who has grown up under communism. When they got out from under communism, he saw the opportunities of the free market and he seized it. He has built a successful company and now he's branching out 
to the rest of the world, and we're pleased that he's coming here to Georgia. So we have a great economic development team, and that's what it takes. But when you don't have any ideas, and when you don't have any tangible evidence that you have policies that are going to make a difference, then you speak in those generalities. And I, I would ask you, as you listen to the things that you're going to be hearing from my opponent, that's all you're going to hear. Um, we can find a billion dollars of waste. Everybody knows this out there. You know what? He has never, ever introduced, first of all, he voted for all those budgets. He has never, ever even introduced an amendment to point out where some of those areas of waste were coming from and offer an amendment to do away with it. It is pure talk. Now, I used this on an audience just a little while ago over Rome. Huh? Maybe some of you here, I think David was there. He may not have heard this. He, he left a little before I did, I think. I tried it out. My wife said she liked it. So anytime, anytime my wife likes something, I, uh, I think I got on the right track. By the way, uh, I told him that, uh, that I thought I'd get a lot of votes if I had a, a sticker that said, re-elect Sandra, first lady. <laughs> I believe we'd get a lot of support for that. But I told him this. The Democrats are out to change Georgia from a red state to a purple state to a blue state. You know when you see a person that's turning purple? It's because they lack oxygen. When you see them turn blue, they're about to die because they lack oxygen. The oxygen of a republic which is what we have. The oxygen of a republic is personal liberties, personal responsibility, and the truth. So if you want to turn our country and our state purple, start tampering with those three. The truth, personal freedoms, and individual responsibility. And you will pretty soon see that it starts to turn purple and it may eventually turn blue. Because at that point, it is a society and a system of government that is dying. And its only way to be resuscitated is for people to take that back and not allow it to happen in the first place. So, I pledge to you that this is my last race. I am not running ever again for anything. <laughs> you have honored me to allow me and Sandra to serve as the first couple of this state for the last four years. She has worked exceptionally hard, as have I. We have results to show for our efforts. I don't want to go back to Washington. I've been there. You sent me there. And I thank you for that experience, but I've had enough of that. I was glad to get back to Georgia where he could get something done. And I commiserate with my congressman. And I commiserate with David what he's going to get into up there. But it's people that were willing to make a difference in that environment. But we can make a difference. We have made a difference. Being number one state in the nation in which to do business is not just an accident. Georgia has never had that distinction before. And now we have had two outside rating agencies that have confirmed that all the ingredients it takes to get that honor, they have come together in Georgia. And it is something that we should all be very proud of. But you know what? My opponent cannot make you that promise. My opponent wants to be the governor of the state, and then he wants to follow in the footsteps of his grandfather. If you do not want to contend with another Carter running for president sometime down the road in the, in the not too distant future, now is the time to stop him. And if we stop him now, he may come back, but he's going to have a pretty big bruise on his head as a result of this election, with your help. Now, you've heard several people talk about this. We're all working hard, but... It doesn't help to work hard if people don't respond and go out and vote. My folks tell me that we have about 23% of people who would be inclined to vote Republican 
who probably are just not going to vote. That's enough to tip the election in the wrong direction. A lot of people think they, they talk to these constitutional officers and they talk to me and they say, oh, Governor, you don't have to worry about anything. You got it made. I, I've said before, that sounds like a pretty good excuse to somebody who's thinking why they're not going to come up and show up on Election Day and vote. We cannot afford for that to happen. So, do what you can do. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends. Get yard signs. Get bumper stickers. Support our Republican candidates because we need all of the help and all of the votes that we can get this time. I do not want Georgia to die from the lack of political oxygen and start turning purple and then blue and then it may be all over and it'll be too late. So now is the time to stop it. With your help, we will be successful and we will make sure that the promises I made at the beginning that I have lived up to, the programs and the reforms that we have put in place with the help of the General Assembly, I want to be there to see them brought to fruition. We are going to lead this state in terms of criminal justice reform. By the way, first time I ever really came to uh, Dawson County, and there are a few here in, in the audience that will remember this because it's about 43 years ago, when I was the assistant district attorney for Jeff Wayne, and I was a prosecutor prosecuting cases at that time in the old Dawson County Courthouse, the one in the middle of the square. Um, and I came and I fell in love with this part of the state of Georgia. I was a middle Georgian. I was a flatlander. And it took me a little bit of time to get used to the fact that uh, you had a hard time finding a flat place on which to build a house or anything else. But Sandra told me I'd get used to it, and I have. But you know, I have a disadvantage in that regard. My hometown is Sandersville, Georgia, in Washington County, in the middle of the state. They call themselves the Kaolin capital of the world. That's the white chalk, by the way, folks. But I cannot raise as much money in my hometown of Sandersville, Georgia, as my opponent can raise in his hometown of Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> That's where he grew up. That's where he graduated from high school. And he can run all the ads that he wants to claiming that he is a Georgian, but his formative years were spent in Illinois. <coughs> Mine were spent fighting gnats in the hot uh, weather <laughs> of middle Georgia. And it makes a difference. So, I need your help. All of us need your help. It's an important election year. We will solidify, if we are successful, a repeat of Republicans holding every constitutional office in the state of Georgia and increasing our lead in the Georgia General Assembly. We certainly need to keep Doug Collins in Congress because he has been an excellent representative. And I think we can all confirm that. We need David Perdue in the Senate not only because we need to try to gain control of the Senate, but if we do not elect David Perdue, we're going backwards. We're not getting closer to reaching majority control of the Senate. We will be losing a seat, and we can't afford to do that if we intend to take control of the United States Senate. So I know you hear a lot of political talk, but this year it is something that really will make a difference in our future. Thank you all for allowing us to be with you today. Thank you.